This is episode two of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash S-A-J-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. And thanks for listening. Tell a friend. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 3. An Early Meeting. Fall 2014. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. A quotation misattributed to Mahatma Gandhi, probably stemming from Nicholas Klein's 1918 address to the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. Note, Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, 1919, page 53. They walked along the trail and talked about national and personal news. Did you hear about another pipeline spill in North Dakota? Jamie and Chris are having a baby. They put half a dozen miles behind them, winding their way along a trail at the canyon's bottom. This canyon in the Mark Twain National Forest, unlike those in the west, was covered in dense vegetation. Dwarfed trees clung to sheer granite faces. In the spring, the swollen stream scoured out the stone walls, depositing gravel and boulders across the canyon floor. But now in the late fall, the water dwindled to a brook. Eventually, the conversation turned to the reason they were all there. Ava looked around the group, which had stopped for a drink at a river promontory. Everybody had dropped their packs and was rummaging for water and snacks. So... I've been thinking about this for a while now. I think it's time, but I'm not sure how to start the discussion. You all know how I feel about where this world is headed. And you know we're all on the same page with you, said Andy, a young man with tousled blonde hair. You said you want to talk about the next step when we were on this trip. We're with you. Eva looked at him and paused. I doubt it, Andy. What do you think I'm going to propose? Starting some group somewhere between Greenpeace and the ELF, I would guess? Whoa, said Lauren Bloom a slim woman in her early 30s, I thought we'd be starting a non-profit of some type, maybe a sustainability consulting firm. Or I was hoping you were going to throw out the idea of starting a commune type of thing, Andy said. Eva's smile grew as they guessed. Nope. D. None of the aboves. Nina turned towards Lauren. If we became the most successful consulting firm in the world, would we be able to stem the tide? Lauren looked down to the scattered twigs and early fallen leaves, thinking for a moment. No, I guess not. Plenty of people are already working within the system, and we can see their results. Andy grinned. More like their lack of results. So you want to work outside the system? Not really. You said something like the ELF or Greenpeace, right? Tell me the biggest success any group like that has had. Andy looked up, scanning the clear sky. I suppose it depends on how you define success. The ELF has burned a few large buildings and disrupted some infrastructure before their larger cell was arrested. Watson and his Sea Shepherds are bugging the hell out of the Japanese and Faroese. Greenpeace has some success with direct actions. Some dams out west are coming down. I don't know what would be the biggest success, though. Probably halting Shell's Arctic exploration? Small potatoes. Andy furrowed his brow. So why not the commune or an eco-farm? That's the direction I was thinking of heading. Eva had unscrewed her Nalgene and was gulping down water. She stopped and looked apologetically in his direction. We can't work within the system since we know that won't work. Uncoordinated attacks only diminish public support for the movement. And I don't think we can just hunker down on our own farm and watch the world collapse around us. Are you thinking seriously about the deep green thing? asked Brett. Lauren and Andy looked questioningly at him. Eric, who had been gazing off into the woods, dropped his eyes down to his feet. Yeah, I think it's time. Lauren's head snapped around. What's this? Why haven't I heard about this? Eric continued to examine his feet. Why implicate you in this before we decide to do it? Implicate? There's a plan and you decide without me? No, no, no. This is when we decide, Ava said. So what is this deep green, Ava, Brett, or Eric? Andy looked from one to another. I gotta say I feel a little bit left out. Lauren glared at Eric. That makes two of us. The three looked guiltily at one another before Brett spoke. Don't feel put out. It wasn't a serious discussion. It was just a thought experiment that grew out of a debate in class. I think alcohol was involved? Oh, this keeps getting better and better, Lauren said. Eric started pacing. Fine, okay, like a band-aid. Right off. Eric waved his arm, spilling water out of his bottle. We're talking about a plan to dismantle the industrial world. What's so sinister about that? All you do is complain about it anyway. Well, I mean doing it by destroying the country's infrastructure. In a week. Well, good luck with that. The smirk that had grown on Lauren's face dropped. Wait, you're serious, aren't you? Ava, Eric, and Brett looked at one another, nodding. Ava screwed the top on her Nalgene. We are now. If you two would stop arguing like an old married couple. We are an old married couple, though, Eric smiled at Lauren. For now, 
Lauren's smile belied her tone. Uh Uh-huh. Well, Lauren, don't feel left out. This is the first time we're talking about it as a real possibility. Let's start at the beginning. Once upon a time, Eva continued over the eye rolls. A few weeks ago, when Eric and I were sitting in on Brett's class, we were discussing direct actions against oil companies. The students debated. One side felt that any form of protest raised public awareness of fossil fuel industry abuses. The others argued that it just encouraged the oil companies because of the contempt they felt for their opponents. Plus, it might turn off some members of the public. At some point, your smart-ass husband asked... Eva looked at Eric. Huh? Oh, right. Eric was crouched, shoving his bottle in his bag. Something like, well, what about completely shutting down the fossil fuel infrastructure by a massive continent-wide direct action? I just wanted to stir the pot since the kiddies were arguing within the confines of the existing system. Taking it as an, he stood, spreading his hands and boomed. Unalterable fact of the universe! Eva rolled her eyes as the echoes of the canyon faded. Yes, that. They pretty much laughed him off as that nut who isn't there for a grade. But it got me thinking, and after class, Brett, Eric, and I were chatting on our way back to the offices, and I asked Brett what he thought about Eric's suggestion. I told him that Mr. Drama, Dr. Drama, if you please, Eric brushed his knuckles against his vest, looking at Brett with a smile, fine, Dr. Drama should tone it down a bit. Eric sighed. He was right, of course, but then again, Brett is the living embodiment of FDR's speak softly and carry a big stick. No, said Lauren. Yes, he is. Look at him all mountain manned up, not saying anything till it's the right time and then saying the right thing. No, you idiot. It was Teddy, not Franklin, that said the thing about the stick. Panama Canal? Oh, damn. Right. Well, regardless, he does that. Eric pointed at Brett. You're right. Brett is as contemplative as you are verbose, Ava said. Brett sat quietly with a growing grin. As I was saying, I thought Dr. Drama had a good idea, if overstated. We started outlining how we could shut down the flow of fossil fuels with the least effort. By the time we had worked that out, it was getting towards dinner, so we headed to the pub, which turned into drinks and a consideration of other vital infrastructure. By the end of the evening, we had brought the whole industrial world down. Well, at least in our heads. Eric tapped his forehead. But we weren't going anywhere with it, so I never brought it up to you. I think I told you we were just hanging out after class. So what, you want to make this a real plan now? asked Andy. I think Eva's right. No amount of working within this system is going to create enough change to save us from ourselves. It has to be a wholesale do-over. Brett nodded. I want to hear this plan, said Lauren. You three are excited all about it, but you've gotten to hash it out. Well, it's not done yet, said Eric. We're only three people with limited knowledge. We need the input of others, like you and Andy at first, and then a few more well-chosen folks to make up the planning committee. After that, we'd each lead up some segment of the plan and recruit the people we'd need to carry it out. Jesus, this has already moved beyond a hypothetical? No, said Eva, but after this weekend it will. We're still shaking the die before we cast it. Can I guess? asked Andy. Guess what? The critical infrastructure you're talking about, Andy continued after Eva, Brett, and Eric grinned back at him. Fossil fuels, you already mentioned that, so pipelines have to go. Then cars, planes, and wait. I assume, I was going to say trains, but then I thought about electric trains. Now I'm wondering if you're going whole hog and going after electricity, too. What generates electricity? asked Eric. Shit. Coal, natural gas, and nuclear in descending order. That's about 85%. So yeah, large-scale generation has to go. The three smiled at him. Lauren, not smiling, passed a bag of trail mix. Andy continued. Industrial agriculture has to be redone. I suppose the entire economy is linked to all these things and will have to be reinvented to work in the brave new world you're making. Ava raised her eyebrows. You don't think the economy is driving the problem? Objection. Leading question, said Eric. Lauren crouched on a nearby rock with her water bottle. Overruled. Does it matter if the economy enabled this state of affairs or reflects it? They're linked, and if one goes, so must the other. But does that mean we're going back to the Stone Age just because you're an archaeologist and we're on the paleo diet for, what, a week? Now the whole country is dragged, kicking and screaming into an episode of the Flintstones? No, 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 of course not. And it was a month on that diet, thank you very much. And what's wrong with experimentation? No, we'd be going back to some aspects of pre-industrial life, so more of the Middle Ages than the Stone Ages, otherwise known as the Dark Ages. Count me out. Eric swung the bag of trail mix. But we've got snacks. And you know, it isn't an either-or scenario. I don't think primitivism is the answer any more than technology is. We need to choose the right things from both, in my opinion. The scientific method and germ theory alongside sustainable small-scale agriculture and a fossil fuel-free life. Remember when we saw those Hobbit movies? What did I tell you? We can't live in a Hobbit hole. Yeah, okay, fine. But you know subterranean houses are heated and cooled by the constant temperature beneath the Earth's crust. Okay, what else would our Earth look like, Andy asked. Eva shrugged. 
We aren't sure, and that is the goal. We should have many human-scale communities trying various survival strategies within parameters like self-sufficiency and quality of life. It's a huge experiment. Beneficial practices will spread, and maladaptive ones will be abandoned. Beyond a few basic rules, communities could decide for themselves. If this is such a good idea, why don't we just go public and try and foment an uprising? Lauren jumped onto a nearby ridge where the river's ice had pushed up a soil and rock dike along its bank during the previous winter and struck a pose. You know, to the barricades, and so on. Well, Jean Valjean, said Eva, because our current way of life is so firmly entrenched in the public mind that only an external force, which will be us, can shake them loose. Not to mention, said Brett, the deeply seated power of the fossil fuel and financial institutions that run our current government. But hey, we have some miles left, and we don't want to lose the light. With that, everybody stowed their water and snacks, shed layers of clothing, hoisted their packs, snapped buckles into place, and cinched down shoulder straps. As they filed down the trail, nobody was talking. Each was lost in thought as they marched through the sheer stone canyon and was uncharacteristically distracted from the stark beauty surrounding them. After a few hours, the descending sun touched only the treetops above the canyon walls, and the group had found a flat enough place to camp for the night. It was on the inside of a bend in the stream, where trees had colonized part of the canyon bottom. Everybody pitched in to gather firewood before dark, and they soon had collected a decent pile of dry deadfall. I'll get our tent squared away, Lauren, if you'll get dinner started, said Eric. I'll give you a hand, said Eva, walking over with her food bag. Andy smirked at them. Way to cleave to traditional gender roles, guys. I'll start filling water if everybody will throw me their empty nail jeans. He ducked as they fulfilled his request literally. Brett already had his bivy sack set up and was stringing a tarp above it. Once that was done, he used a collapsible spade to dig a small trench uphill of his bedding into the sandy gravel of the steam-deposited sediments. He moved on, making similar features uphill of the other tents before heading off to dig a quick latrine, uphill and a bit farther away from the stream. By the time he got back to camp, Lauren and Eva were busy around a small but growing fire, Lauren feeding thumb-sized stick to the growing blaze as Eva readied a pot full of water. "'What's on the menu tonight?' he asked. Eva looked up. Lentils with sun-dried tomatoes and herbs cooked in broth. I've got a bit of Parmesan to top it, if you like. We're baking some apples with batter and a bit of brown sugar for dessert, but Andy saw some trout while he was getting water, and he grabbed a hand line and went back to see if he could catch a few fish. Soon the lentils were bubbling, and the smell of apples wafted from the tight-lidded pan tucked among the coals. Two trout sizzled as their skin crisped at the fire's heat. Andy had just added oil, salt, and pepper to the fish after cleaning and skewering them on a green stick. Everybody sat around the fire drinking coffee, tea, and cocoa, waiting for the first course to be ready. Eric was the first to circle back to the subject that they had all been digesting since the mid-afternoon. I do worry that our group will be too bougie. Andy furrowed his brow. Boozy? Bourgeois. I mean the wealthy have the most to lose and will fight this tooth and nail. And even though those at the bottom of the economic heap are going to be the most severely affected by climate change, asking them to go along with a revolution seems to just pile on more injustice. What I mean is, how are we going to get Walmart shoppers fired up about this? I use this term, of course, as just a shorthand for a few of our fellow first worlders that are most tied into the throwaway consumption-driven lifestyle. It's a huge gamble whether or not these people will react in a positive way. And what about people of color, Lauren asked. When people think of tree huggers and eco-radicals, they're usually thinking about middle-class white kids. But if I can put on my social science hat, Eric pulled down his hat over his forehead. Polling suggests that a greater percentage of people of color think climate change should be a major policy issue than whites. Ooh, the lentils are done. Plates! Everybody passed Lauren their dishes, and she distributed steaming heaps. Maybe that's a built-in economic bias, since people of color suffer more economic discrimination. Even nodded. You might be right. I imagine that as white folks tend to dominate our society, they would have the most to lose from a radical reordering of society. Whoa, this is good, but hot. Eva fanned her mouth. Maybe the movement tends to be dominated by people from more affluent, usually white backgrounds because they have the time to do it. How can you ask somebody working full-time or more with day-to-day problems to throw in with a revolution? Even if success would mean a more equitable, sustainable world for their children, they know the current devil, and it might be better to stick with him. Or her, said Eric, eliciting more eye rolls. And it's not just poor people in the U.S. that resist change. Those living in precarious situations across the world are notoriously risk-averse, and what is riskier than overturning our entire system? Lauren reached over and pulled Eric's hat up. Enough of that know-it-all voice, please. Great, Brett said through a mouthful of lentils. We've identified the problem and talked ourselves back to where we started. How do we get a diverse movement started? If we don't, we'll have real trouble when the time comes because communities across the country will need someone local they know and trust to organize them in the short term. I think we'll need to cultivate a network of local leaders that resonate within their communities, Ava said. Maybe through community gardening groups? I mean, vegetable gardeners, not necessarily the local fancy schmancy garden club. They've got a skill set that will be vital for the post-fossil fuel world. 
Yeah, and it's a more diverse group than, say, the Sierra Club, Andy said. Not that we should count them out. I was thinking it would be good if the government made a push for everyone to get ready for this. Everyone stopped and looked at Lauren. Eric broke the silence. Um, the national government would probably end up disintegrating? Well, obviously, but right now it has the most influence on a national level, right? Asked Lauren. Everybody nodded in agreement. Then we should try and hijack the organization to get people ready. I don't get it, said Andy. We'll tell the government what is about to happen? No, 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 no. We'll couch it some other way. Say, disaster preparedness. For example, we find some leaders who would be amenable to a national-level campaign. Something like the prepper phenomenon, but with less of the paranoia. Look at the Swiss. They maintain national and personal preparedness stockpiles. If we could get the government to create neighborhood stockpiles of food, water, and basic supplies, and encourage people to do the same at home, it would stymie national panic, food rights, and other potential problems in the cities if power, gas, and fuel were cut off. Lauren stopped because everyone was staring at her. What? Jesus, said Eric. Why didn't I think of that? The others nodded and murmured in agreement. Lauren smiled. Probably because you're too excited about the collapse of the national government, so you put its usefulness out of your mind. I could probably use some of the connections I have to start exploring this. It sounds like a two-pronged approach, then, Brett said. Prong one is a grassroots network of community leaders who are recruited without really knowing the full extent of our plans, but are given the tools they'll need to get a neighborhood organized and working together. And the second prong is a national push for disaster preparedness. I say it's still a gamble, Andy said. I'm not sure we're going to get the people of Walmart on board in time. Ooh, and the fish looks done. Who wants some? The other four pushed their now empty plates forward. I'd say it's the biggest gamble of the whole thing, Eric said, taking his plate back. But things will change whether we or they want it to. At least this way, we'll have a fighting chance. Andy continued to distribute the fish. Maybe fighting isn't the best word to use in this context. We have to appeal to their patriotism. What? Everybody had swiveled their heads towards him in surprise. Yeah, okay, I'm not a big flag waver, but I think you'd see a strong correlation between those who might not react so well to what we're talking about and those who consider themselves to be the most patriotic. Let's channel that energy into a positive direction. I dislike slogans, but maybe a campaign playing on the patriotism and preparedness. Bring up lots of history, like the victory gardens, the self-sufficiency of those who colonized the frontiers. Yuck. Brett nearly choked on a large bite. No, 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 not your fish. I mean your idea. You want to enshrine those who displace the native populations in North South America? I know, I know, I don't like it, but you know that sort of thing will appeal to a different group of people, and we have to get everybody on board, not just you liberal pinko kami kumbaya college professors. Brett shook his head. Yeah, I guess, but let's try to keep from making too heroic a figure out of some dubious historical personalities, okay? And emphasize that people on the frontier work together. The best rugged individualists were those who were competent enough to help others. If we're going to be that specific, we're going to have to let someone with serious influence in on our plans, Lauren said. Eric nodded. It would have to be someone thoroughly trustworthy. And it would have to be a gradual exposition, said Eva. Best would be to get him or her to arrive at this conclusion without us bringing it up directly, Brett said. Lauren gazed up at the stars for a minute. It'll be tricky, but it's probably the best way to achieve nationwide success, don't you think? No, you're right, said Eric. It would just be the most difficult and potentially compromising part of our plan. It's the big gamble, Andy said. And is the dessert ready? Chapter 4. 1.1. The Precepts. Following Nass, Leopold, and other natural philosophers, we have devised three precepts for reforming our society. First, we must recognize that we are one of many species on this planet. Second, we must work to mimic natural successful systems and live off the planet's surpluses. And third, we must prefer the simple to the complex and the complex to the complicated. 1.1.1. One of many. Human beings' ability to think has enabled us to overvalue our position on Earth. While we can outthink insects, they outeat us, outweigh us, and outnumber us. Metacognition, or our ability to think about thinking, ourselves, and our place in the world, however, has endowed humans with hubris. Many cultural traditions, not just the Judeo-Christian ones, believe that the world was created for humans. Anything that is not human is considered a resource for humans to exploit. Every animal, plant, and mineral is thought to be just waiting for a human to come along and make use of it. Instead, we must recognize that we are one species on the planet, and just like every other organism, we have evolved with special traits. We are not the fastest or the strongest, nor do we have sharp claws or dangerous teeth. Our specialty is thinking and communicating. That's all. These abilities have granted us an outsized influence on the world and dominion over other organisms. But with this power comes responsibility. 
We have been shirking our responsibility and abusing our influence. We must take a more objective view of life on Earth and use that perspective to rein in our arrogance. 1.1.2 Natural Mimicry We live in a post-enlightenment society, and most of us believe that science and careful study can lead to greater understanding of the world, often through experimentation. Nature has been running experiments in survival for over 4 billion years, since the beginning of life on Earth. While we are quick to share the latest scientific discovery on social media, we are loath to critically examine our own way of life when compared to the many experiments carried out by nature. For example, no species has survived by exhausting its resources, yet we appear hell-bent on burning the last drop of oil. No other omnivore depends so completely on so few species as plants as we do. And furthermore, no mammals, including us, have adapted to survive on such a high consumption of cereals and grains. Successful species, that is, those that have stable populations and have survived for millions of years, share a number of traits. First, they depend on the sun, decomposing organics, or geothermal heat for external sources of energy. Second, successful species respect their resources. Wolves eat prey that are young, old, and sick, leaving the herd to reproduce. And herbivores migrate to fresh pastures, leaving the exhausted ones to regenerate. Third, omnivores survive because they eat a wide variety of foods akin to having a diverse stock portfolio. If one quote-unquote stock fails, they can eat more of the others. We ignore the successful adaptations around us at our peril. We knowingly overtax our environment by using more resources than necessary. 1.1.3. Simple is greater than complex, which is greater than complicated. We purposefully complicate our lives and call it progress. Living depends on five actions, sleeping, eating, drinking, breathing, and eliminating, plus procreation when we discuss the continuation of the species. From a minimalist point of view, everything we do beyond fulfilling these five plus actions is an added complication. This critique labels almost all jobs in the industrialized world as complications. Most of us do not build our own shelters or beds or grow or even cook our own food, gather our drinking water, ferment our favorite beverages, or worry about bodily waste. On a daily basis, we must only decide in which way we wish to fulfill our needs. Most of our time is really spent in pursuit of diversions. Of course, many of our diversions are exciting and bring us great joy. Art, music, sports, storytelling, and games. Our society, though, takes for granted the fulfillment of the five actions and consequently has shifted its focus to the fulfilling of diversions. Furthermore, the way in which we fulfill our needs has become incredibly complicated. We must eliminate the complications, reduce complexity, and champion the simple and straightforward. The more of our five actions that we can see to for ourselves, the better. End of Episode 2 of Eco Gorillas. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs>